Now welcome back to another MLB recap. Now with the NL wild card race jam packed right now, as literally everyone besides the Marlins and the Rockies are less than two games back of the last wild card spot. The Cardinals were trying to avoid the series loss against the Marlins on Wednesday down in Miami. The Marlins did a great job playing spoilers as Brian De La Cruz and Jesus Sanchez went back to back for their 13th and 14th home runs, respectively, on the season to put Miami up two to nothing after the first inning. But the Cardinals quickly tied the game on a Nolan Gorman home run to center field and Brendan Donovan. He had an RBI single that played in Nolan Arenado. Now, both teams played the back-and-forth game in the late innings as Miami briefly took the lead on this sack fly to right field from Dane Myers. Then a half inning later in the Cardinals' seventh, a Jake Berger fielding error allowed Mason Wynn to score from first base, tying the game 3-3. Three to three. Now, in the end, the Marlins got the last laugh as Otto Lopez singled home Tim Anderson for the 4-3 walk-off victory, as this was a tough pill to swallow for the Cardinal faithful. Now this loss drops their lead to just a half game for that last Senior Circuit wildcard spot. Now, despite Detroit having their ace on the bump in Tariq Skubal down in Atlanta, who was 8-2, with a 2.20 ERA coming into his start on Wednesday. The Braves offense, they jumped on him early. Ozzie Albies, he singled to left field, driving in Sean Murphy, making it one to nothing Braves in the second. Then an inning later, Sean Murphy was credited with driving in a run after driving the ball over the center field wall. His two-run home run made it 3 to nothing Atlanta after three full innings. Now, it wasn't long until the Braves scored their next run as Ramon Liriano jumped on the first pitch of the fourth inning from lefty Tariq Skubal. Now, despite Skubal being in the early frontrunner, for the AL Cy Young Award this season. His one kryptonite can be his predictability with his fastball usage for the first pitch of an at-bat. Now, finally, Braves catcher Sean Ryan Murphy came through again by cracking his second long ball of the day to left field. This secured a 7-0 victory for the Braves over the Tigers in Atlanta. Now, the Reds and Pirates game on Wednesday was an old-fashioned pitcher's duel as Hunter Green and Mitch Keller went head-to-head. -head. The Reds' ace, Hunter Green, lasted six in the third innings, striking out nine Pirates, walked nobody, and gave up only two hits to Pittsburgh's offense. While on the other side, the Pirates' Mitch Keller was able to get through seven full innings, only relinquishing two hits, fanning seven Reds, and giving up two free passes. Now, the offense in this ball game came in the Pittsburgh half of the eighth, that was when Brian Reynolds cracked his 10th long ball of the season. This solo home run was all the Pirates needed to get past the Red Legs as he defeated them one to nothing. Now, the Phillies were trying to complete the sweep of the scrappy Padres in Philadelphia. Now, San Diego struck first on this Jackson Merrill home run in the second inning. However, Bryce Harper responded with a solo shot of his own the opposite way. This tied the game 1-1. One to one. Now, San Diego took the lead in the late innings on a pair of singles. First, hitting machine Luis Arise smacked an RBI base hit out to Nick Castellanos in right field that scored Jackson Merrill. Then, an inning later, Kyle Higashioka triple home Jose Azokar. Manny Machado and Hassan Kim, giving the Padres a four-run lead. Now, a second Bryce Harper home run in the Phillies' half of the eighth turned out to be a mute point, as the best team in the senior circuit fell 5-2 to two to the Padres. Now, let's head out to the north side of Chicago, where Ian Happ and Dansby Swanson went back-to-back -back in the fourth inning to start the scoring in this one. Then, a few batters later, Pete Crow Armstrong laid down a sack bunt with no outs and runners on first and second. Now, the bunt was to Chapman at third base, who bobbled the ball and threw it wide of Brooks at first base. Michael Bush scored on the play, making it 3 to nothing Chicago. Now San Francisco cut Chicago's lead down to two runs following a productive out of Ramos. Now Ramos, he grounded into a force out at second base that was fielded by Swanson. Thyro Estrada scored on the play and Ramos reached first base safely. This made it 3-1 to one Cubs. Now a Dansby Swanson single in the seventh played in Nico Horner and Cody Bellinger making it 5-1 to one Cubbies. Now things, they got interesting and uncomfortable for Chicago faithful as Jorge Soler popped a grand slam to the bleachers in left field at Wrigley. Now despite Soler leaving the yard in grand style, it wasn't enough 
for the Giants to prevail against the Cubbies on Wednesday as they lost 6-5, to five, splitting the four-game set on the north side. Now, before I go any further, I have to mention the passing of one of baseball's all-around great players, Willie Mays. The San Francisco Giants announced on Tuesday that the Hall of Famer passed away peacefully in his sleep on Tuesday afternoon. Willie Mays, he started his professional career with the Birmingham Black Barons in 1948, and I assume uh, he played for them during 1949, but there is no stat line shown for the 1949 season on baseball reference. I can only Assume that MLB and the Negro Leagues Museum Historical Society hasn't found any box scores for that particular season for the uh, Barons. So that's kind of my educated assumption on, on that one as to why you may see a blank for the 1949 season if you look up Willie Mays on Baseball Reference. Uh, but regardless, Mays, he signed with the Giants in 1954 for grand and debuted a year later on May the 25th of 1951. Now, after going 0 for 12 to start his MLB career, Mays finally got his first MLB hit on a home run off a of Braves Hall of Famer Warren Spahn in Milwaukee. Now, Mays also got the opportunity to play in the World Series that season following Bobby Thompson's shot her around the world against the Dodgers. Now, despite Mays' Giants losing 4-2 in that 1951 series uh, to the Yankees, the 20-year-old won the Rookie of the Year. Now, after a year away from baseball due to military service in 1953, Mays returned in 54 and ended up winning the MVP, cracking 41 home runs, driving in 110, and batting 345 with a 1.78 OPS. But after looking at his stats, the craziest thing to me was the fact that he came in fourth place in MVP voting the next year when he lost to the Dodgers' Roy Campanella. During that 55 season, Mays hit 10 more home runs and drove in 17 more runs than he did the previous season in 1951. The only reason I can think as of why he lost the MVP to Campanella was because Campanella's Dodgers, you know, won the World Series that year. So, you know, maybe it was the fact that, A, I don't know when they did the voting. I don't know if it was in the offseason or was it during the World Series. During that time, I'm not 100% sure, but maybe the fact that Campanella's Dodgers went to the World Series and Mays' Giants did not could have been the difference maker for him not winning that MVP. Now, Mays would win his second MVP a near decade later with the San Francisco Giants at the age of 34 when he cranked a career-high 52 home runs while also driving in 112 RBIs, leading all of baseball in OBP, slugging percentage, OPS, OPS+, Plus, and total bags. And finally, we'll end it on this iconic catch everybody knows about and that happened back in the 1954 World Series, uh, Game 1 of that series against the Cleveland Indians. If the Giants lost that series against the Indians, would it have been as renowned? Possibly yes, because there are you know uh, moments in baseball history in the World Series that have been renowned despite the guy who made the play or the team who, 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 who came together to make a play lost the World Series. But I think the fact that it was Willie Mays and that they won the World Series against the crappy Cleveland Indians, you know, made it just more iconic. Now, I finally found it really interesting that the last MLB game Mays played in was Game 7 of the 73 World Series when he was a part of the Mets. And of all places, the series ended in the Bay Area when they played the Oakland Athletics. That was, of course, right at the tail end of the A's dominance in the early 1970s. And now let's go to the Mariners and Guardians game. Now the Guardians were in complete control of this contest against the Mariners as Josh Naylor drove in the first run after singling to right field. Then an inning later, a man known for his ability to put the ball in play, Stephen Kwan, actually went yard for his fifth home run of 2024. Now Jose Ramirez ran out an infield single to second base. Andres Jimenez scored on the play. Then a few batters later, Josh Naylor popped his 18th long ball of the season, which extended the Guardians' lead by six runs after five full innings. Now in the sixth, Josh's brother, Bo, came through via the small ball as he singled home another Cleveland run, making it 7 to nothing Guardians. And finally, wouldn't you know, it was Josh who said, move over, little bro, and let me show you how it's done. Oh, God, I'm such a great writer. Um, the elder Naylor cranked his second home run of the game and his 19th of the season to secure a 8 nothing 
shutout of the Mariners. Now we have some bad news. Pitching injuries galore have been coming out. Uh, the Orioles, Kyle Bradish, has just underwent Tommy John surgery, taking him out for the rest of the season and part of 2025. And another guy who just came back from the IEL and will be back on the IEL, Walker Bueller. Yeah, he's been placed on the 15-day IEL with right hip inflammation. Now, Bueller, he alluded to the possibility of going on the injured list after another poor outing Tuesday. In his eighth start of the season since returning from an almost two-year-long rehab process from elbow surgery, Bueller allowed seven runs in four innings against the Rockies. You know, this is this is when the injury bug starts to bite a little bit. Come June, July, dog days of summer. But, you know, me and Mets talk with Aiden had this conversation all the time. He's a big believer that the pitch clock is the main source behind this. You, you look at a guy like uh, Alec Manoa, you know, uh, who, who just is always hurt and just can't find his stuff. Maybe the pitch clock, you know, it's faster, but I think it's rushing these guys. That's kind of, uh, I guess I would say, what is it my opinion really? It's Hayden's opinion. So I give all the credit to Hayden for this one. But he thinks that these pitchers are conditioned to kind of you know, move as fast on the mound, and, 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 and you know, they're, they're rushed. They, they, they really are rushed. And it was interesting, I was watching a video a couple of days ago where in one of uh, Clayton Kershaw's no-hitters, uh, the umpire told him to slow down, to slow down on the mound and take his time. And you wonder, that will never happen again. An umpire will never say to a pitcher, slow down, regardless of the uh, potential historic moment on the precipice of the next few hitters. Uh, or pitches, you know what I mean? So it's an interesting theory that the pitch clock could be the main contributor to this uh, pitching injury phenomenon, and we'll see if MLB does anything about that in the near future. But I'm rattling off, and that's really all I got. I'm out of breath. Uh, please like, please comment, subscribe. I'd appreciate it, and I'll catch you guys later.